30,000 sailors, 400 foot ships, two years at sea, no refrigeration, no modern medicine, none of the tech we think you need to survive. And get this, on voyages where a single mistake could kill thousands, not a single sailor died from scurvy. Scurvy was the disease that killed more sailors than anything else. It rotted your gums black, made your teeth fall out, killed you in four weeks. But somehow, the Chinese had already figured it out, using methods that don't look impressive at first, but turned out to be devastatingly effective. So how did they do it? And why would the smallest failure have doomed the entire fleet? How did Admiral Zheng, he keep 30,000 people alive and healthy for years on the open ocean? The answer? Five brilliant technologies, and I'm going to show you each one. First, let me show you what we're dealing with here. These weren't just ships, they were floating cities. The main treasure ships measured 417 feet long. That's four times bigger than anything Columbus sailed, 10 times heavier than the ships used by other explorers. Between 1405 and 1433, Admiral Zheng He led seven massive expeditions, over 200 ships, 30,000 sailors, every single one needing food, water, and medicine every single day while surrounded by salt water. Now here's what blows my mind. At a time when long distance voyages regularly collapsed under disease and starvation, these fleets kept going. When Vasco da Gama sailed 60 years later, he lost over a hundred men to scurvy alone. The Chinese had cracked a code that would puzzle maritime doctors for centuries. They'd solved a problem that shouldn't have been solvable at that scale, keeping tens of thousands of people alive, far from land for years at a time, in tropical heat, where food normally spoils in days. Today, I'm breaking down the five technologies that made this possible. Each one solved a specific survival challenge, and by the end, you'll see why these solutions were centuries ahead of their time. Let's dive in. Let's start with the biggest killer, Scurvy. Scurvy killed more sailors than all sea battles, storms and accidents combined. Nearly two million sailors died from it between the 1400s and 1700s. It's caused by not getting enough vitamin C. And once symptoms appear, you usually have less than a month before it becomes fatal. Your gums turn black, your teeth fall out, old wounds reopen. Eventually, you bleed to death from the inside. Captains expected to lose half their crew on long voyages. That's how common it was. But the Chinese had something different. I call it the vitamin C battery. Ships carried thousands of ceramic tubs filled with soybeans. Add water, put them in sunlight, and you get continuous harvests of sprouted beans. These sprouts contained vitamin C. Now, this isn't guesswork. Modern researchers measured it. Sprouted soybeans have 10 to 30 milligrams of vitamin C per 100 grams. That's the same as fresh cabbage. And you only need about 10 milligrams daily to prevent scurvy. Ma Huan was the fleet historian. He sailed on three of Zheng He's voyages. In his diaries, he wrote about the nurseries on transport ships that continuously produced these sprouts. These weren't emergency rations. This was a system one that only worked if it was maintained every single day. Check out this timeline. Chinese fleets used sprouted beans in the 1400s. The first published cure for scurvy didn't come until 1753. That's when English doctor James Lind figured out citrus worked. The Royal Navy didn't officially use lemon juice until 1795. That's a 390 year gap. The results, 30,000 sailors notably free of scurvy deaths, while other voyages considered scurvy an inevitable cost of sailing. But preventing scurvy only solved one problem, because even perfectly healthy sailors don't survive if their food is ruined. These ships had to carry enough food for 30,000 people for months, maybe years, and there was one thing that could destroy it all in minutes, water. Most ships back then were basically hollow wooden shells. Breach the hull, seawater floods everything. 
your grain gets destroyed, your ship often sinks. But Chinese engineers built something revolutionary, watertight compartments. They called them bulkheads. These divided the hull into isolated chambers, each one completely sealed from the others. This tech was already advanced by the 11th and 12th centuries, way before Zheng He's time. Here's how it worked. One compartment gets breached during a storm. Water stays trapped in that single section instead of destroying the entire ship. The rest of the ship stays dry. You can keep sailing while you make repairs. Three big advantages. Safety, one hole doesn't sink the ship. Organization, you can separate different types of cargo. Structure, thick walls make the hull stronger. Now here's the wild part. Marco Polo wrote about these bulkheads in the late 1200s. He saw Chinese ships and described them in detail. But the British Navy didn't use watertight compartments until 1795. Chief Engineer Samuel Bentham finally designed warships with them. That's over 500 years later. In 2010, UNESCO recognised this technology as intangible cultural heritage. They acknowledged how revolutionary it was. For the treasure fleets, this system kept grain holds bone dry, even in rough weather. Millions of pounds of food stayed perfectly preserved, while other ships lost their supplies to water damage. But dry grain only gets you so far. Without protein, strength fades, and weak crews don't survive long voyages. Keeping grain dry was crucial, but protein, that was even harder. In tropical heat, meat rots in 48 hours. Salt helps, but it wasn't enough for voyages lasting years. The Chinese solution was called jian, fermented soy paste made with koji mold. This wasn't just preservation, it was an active defense using controlled biology to outcompete rot before it even began. The fermentation creates an environment where bad bacteria can't survive. The koji mold breaks down proteins into smaller pieces your body can use. It creates acids and alcohols that kill spoilage organisms. This technology had a long history. The earliest reference, Han Dynasty tomb writings. By the second century BCE, agricultural texts had specific recipes, soybeans mixed with wheat flour. By the 6th century, detailed procedures were being recorded. By the 8th century, the process was streamlined for mass production. We know treasure fleet ships carried Jiang. Archaeological evidence confirms it. Here's what made this special. Salt-preserved meat was barely edible. You had to rinse it with precious fresh water before eating, and it still tasted terrible. Jiang preserved proteins. You could eat them directly. They tasted better. They kept more nutrition, and they lasted for months, sometimes years. Ships carried Jiang in sealed ceramic vessels, and the fermentation was so effective that some proteins could last for years. This gave the fleet something rare at sea. Options. They weren't racing against spoilage, they were managing it. They could undertake much longer voyages without worrying about protein but you can't survive on food alone, you need water. Even with preserved food, there's still a fundamental problem, water. The fleet needed drinking water for 30,000 people every single day, and without it, the journey wouldn't last more than a few weeks. Across passages that could last six months or more, storing that much fresh water, not practical. Too heavy. The Chinese solution was thermal distillation, using the ship's existing cooking furnaces. Each treasure ship had 15 or more furnaces. They burned continuously for cooking meals. These furnaces were adapted with specially designed bronze and iron pots, with channels built in for condensation. The process was simple but clever. Heat seawater to boiling. The steam rises, it condenses on cool surfaces. You get pure fresh water. But this wasn't basic condensation. The pots were engineered with internal channels, designed specifically for efficiency. Historians believe Chinese fleets used multiple water systems at once. Thermal distillation from cooking furnaces, rainwater collection, freshwater storage tanks. This created redundancy. 
and at sea, redundancy is the difference between inconvenience and disaster. Want to know when modern navies got integrated desalination? 1954, the USS Nautilus. That's a 550 year gap. Even today, cruise ships need separate desalination plants. They consume massive amounts of fuel. Chinese engineers integrated it into existing cooking systems. No waste, maximum efficiency. This system let the treasure fleet supplement their fresh water during long passages. It gave them flexibility that other ships couldn't match. But there's one more technology, and it's the most impressive. The most remarkable technology was also the most obvious. These ships were so large, they could carry their own food production systems. At over 400 feet long, treasure ships had dedicated decks for live animals and vegetable gardens. We know this worked because of archaeological evidence. The Nanhai number one wreck. A Song Dynasty cargo ship discovered off Vietnam. It contained 202 documented animal bones. The breakdown, 86 sheep and goat bones, 46 chicken bones, 40 goose bones, nine pig bones, one cattle bone. These animals weren't backups. They were part of a deliberately designed system, food producing more food while the ship kept moving. They were part of a complete food production system. Animals ate stored grains. They provided fresh meat and eggs daily. The fleet achieved something rare in pre-modern history, near complete self-sufficiency while moving across the open ocean for extended periods. This gave Chinese fleets a massive advantage. Other naval expeditions relied on port resupply. If they couldn't reach friendly harbours, they faced starvation. Zheng He's fleet carried its own food production system. This enabled longer passages, reduced dependencies that often doomed other voyages. Some ships even had vegetable patches in specially designed growing areas. Combined with the sprouted bean systems, the fleets had access to fresh vegetables throughout their voyages. Think about what this means. These weren't just ships, they were floating cities. With their own agriculture, livestock and food processing systems, the scale was unprecedented and wouldn't be matched for centuries. So there you have it. Five interconnected technologies, sprouted beans for vitamin C, watertight bulkheads protecting supplies, fermented soy paste preserving protein, integrated desalination for fresh water and floating ecosystems for fresh food. The timeline is staggering. Chinese fleets used these technologies in the early 1400s. Comparable solutions didn't appear elsewhere until the 1700s and 1800s. Some, like integrated desalination, didn't show up until the 1950s. But here's the twist. In 1433, an imperial decree ended the treasure fleet expeditions. China turned inward, abandoned maritime exploration just as these technologies reached peak effectiveness. The knowledge remained, but the will to use it for exploration disappeared. Today, you can see the legacy of these innovations everywhere. Watertight compartments, standard in all modern ships, fermentation, cornerstone of industrial food preservation, sprouted vegetables, health food movement, desalination plants, provide fresh water to millions worldwide. The Chinese treasure fleets represent one of history's greatest what-ifs. With technology centuries ahead of its time and the organizational capability to deploy it on an unprecedented scale, they proved something timeless. That the hardest challenges of exploration aren't solved by strength or luck, but by thoughtful design layered problem solving and human ingenuity. They didn't just survive months at sea without refrigeration, they thrived. And in doing so, they showed what's possible when human ingenuity is given the chance to solve problems, one clever system at a time.